want to know about a CEO and how they behave, Dr. Olson's the guy. He knows all about it. He has been recognized by the Institute of Management Accountants as an emerging scholar in his field of research, and I look forward to hearing what he has to say today on leadership from narcissistic CEOs. Dr. Olson. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Skousen. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you today. I'll talk to you a little bit about some of my own research and the kind of the broad view of uh, what we've learned about narcissistic CEOs. Uh, I do have to throw out some disclaimers to start because I always get these questions, so I need to throw out some disclaimers. The first one is the things I'll talk about are average effects. Uh, you're going to want to think about specific individuals, and yes, that is something you should do, but I'm not going to talk about specific individuals. Um, it's just safer that way to, to, uh, for me. The second thing is, and I'll explain this a little more in detail in a minute, we're going to talk about narcissism as a personality trait that everyone has. All of you have this trait to some extent or another. Um, and it's actually a needed thing for a lot of people in, in their jobs. They should have a sense of narcissism. It's not a bad thing per se. Um, in its extreme, it can be a personality disorder. Now that is usually bad, and usually we think of uh, some really dysfunctional people uh, that might have that. So I'm gonna talk about the trait, um, not necessarily the, the disorder, and I'll get into what that means. So to start, the, before we get into what CEOs uh, and how they exhibit narcissism, I'm gonna talk about what narcissism is. You may have in your mind already uh, some expectations about what you think narcissism is. You've heard this term, you may have used the term, um, but it's a little more intricate uh, than you may think at first. To start, we need to go all the way back to some Greek mythology and understand where the term Narcissus comes from. Um, so here's the, one of the famous pictures of Narcissus looking in the, the pond, and he sees an image of himself. And so here's some text that uh, kind of gives background to the story. Um, all that is lovely in himself he loves, and in his witless ways, he wants himself. Yet never may he wreathe his arms around the image of himself. He knows not what he there beholds. And this is the first key point. People often think of nar uh, narcissism as self-love, where this image uh, and the, the text says, he knows not what he there beholds. It's not necessarily about self-love, okay? It's actually there's some self-hatred, a lack of self-recognition. He does not recognize who he is okay, in the image. But what he sees inflames his longing, and the error that deceives allures his eyes. But why, O oh foolish boy, so vainly catching at this flitting form? The cheat that you are seeking has no place. Avert your gaze, and you will lose your love. For this that holds your eyes is nothing save the image of yourself reflected back at you. It comes and waits with you. It has no life. It will depart if you will only go. So if we think of narcissism not as self-love, more of a self-hatred, it helps us get into the psychological roots of where it comes from. Some of the categories that you might think uh, could explain what this is are traits such as being authoritative. Someone has a sense that they have authority, they're com a commanding presence. They may feel that they are superior, that they're better than other people. Uh, that they have better knowledge or better abilities uh, than others. They have a sense of self-sufficiency, that they can do it on their own. They don't need help from others. They can do it. Now, if you think about those three traits, they're often actually called kind of the good side of narcissism. Um, think about someone like me, a professor. If I'm going to stand up in front of a room of students and try to teach them, you need to have some sense of authority, that you are the authority figure as the teacher. You may even have to have a sense of superiority, that you might have knowledge that's worth imparting to people, that you can help benefit them. And a sense of self-sufficiency is often admired in people, that they are, are disciplined, they can take care of themselves, they're independent. Um, so those traits, could argue, uh, might actually be a good thing. Now the, these other traits aren't clearly as a good thing. Um, exhibitionism. This is the sense that they uh, want to be seen, and they're going to make a, a show. Uh, they're going to try to get attention and have a claim from other people. This is tied to the trait of vanity, where you know people. This is the kind of self-love 
that people usually think of with narcissism, that they, have, they want to look good all the time, they want their image to be sharp and pristine. Um, and the way they get this is usually through exploitative means. They'll, uh, they don't care about what other people uh, happens to them. They lack empathy. And so they're going to exploit situations for their own benefit. Um, then the last one's entitlement. Um, and this type of entitlement is not necessarily the general sense of entitlement. It's really a narcissistic entitlement. It's malignant. It's really negative that they think they deserve more than other people. Um, some of the things that we've seen uh, in general research on narcissism is that they're really great at finding opportunities for self-enhancement. When they're presented with a situation, if it benefits them, they'll go after it. They'll make it happen to make themselves look good. They'll constantly seek for the attention of others. Um, and I'm going to show you some ways that narcissistic CEOs do this uh, that really affects how firms function as they seek attention. If you've ever met a narcissist and you tried to deliver negative criticism, um, it doesn't go well, okay? They don't hear it, okay? Um, there's been research that actually shows that uh, they psychologically, cognitively, do not process the information. Um, just in one ear and out the other. It's kind of especially true with narcissists. Um, and what happens when you do that, they, they often respond negatively, uh, and that's where we see things like low integrity, Okay, they'll exploit situations, they're, they're not truthful at all times, um, and they'll engage in deviant behavior. And uh, I'll show you that narcissistic CEOs engage in that uh, in certain ways. Here's a couple of quotes that help explain, I think, succinctly uh, how you should think about a narcissist. So this is from a group of psychologists, and they say, think of narcissists as individuals for whom enhancing the positivity of the self specifically to achieve status and esteem is overwhelmingly important. Much of their psychological and social lives is directed toward this goal. When they wake up, they think about it. When they're going out through the day, they think about this. This is, occupies their mind and their life. Um, the next quote comes from a popular press book that some of you may have seen or read uh, called The Mirror Effect, where it looks at how celebrities uh, kind of accentuate the narcissism in our society. And here they say that narcissists are masters at creating ways of getting what they do need to exist. Positive feedback and stroking from others. And this ties back to that uh, disconnect that Narcissus, when he couldn't recognize himself, when a narcissist is disconnected from their self-image, uh, they're often looking for ways to reinforce what they think their self-image is. So they look for positive feedback and stroking from others. And why is this important today? This is not a new personality trait, uh, but there's evidence to suggest that it's something that we should be aware of and think about in today's world. So here's a little bit, a little bit old data, but I think it shows you the trend. This would continue upwards. Um, what we have here are scores on the narcissistic personality inventory, uh, which is the psychological measure that you'd fill out to say, how nar narcissistic am I? And what you can see here is back in the 1980s, the average on that scale is about 15, and we've seen a steady increase. Now, everyone that took, uh, is in this data was college sophomores. So it's the same group every year, it's college sophomores, college sophomores, college sophomores, and you see it just creeping up and creeping up. Um, if you took this today, I promise you it would be even higher, uh, based on my experience with college students. Um, <laughs> And they showed that one out of 16 of those of all ages experience symptoms of this. So it's not just college students. It's adults and people in all walks of life. Um, that chart increased. That was a 13% increase in the average score. Um, another study, which with a huge sample, showed that 6% of the population experience high levels of narcissism. Um, that's a lot of people when you think about how many people there are. In general, men are more narcissistic than women, um, and younger people are more narcissistic than older people. Um, and what causes this? Where does this trait of narcissism come from? Um, is it something we're born with? Does it develop over time? Um, the first explanation is a clinical one. And 
this view it kind of says, you know, what happens in your upbringing that uh, affects how you behave? So in its extreme form, the disorder form, it's caused by early childhood trauma in the form of sexual, physical, and emotional abuse or severe neglect. Such early childhood experiences threaten self-esteem, okay? Think about the not being able to recognize yourself, okay? That's what happens when a young child experiences early childhood trauma when they're developing their self-image and we disrupt it, okay? And they can't connect with it. Um, it leads to feelings of shame, emptiness, and self-blame, which cause an unrelenting desire to seek attention, admiration, and external validation. Now, that's the extreme form. Um, and it's happening. Um, here's some data from 1980 to 1993, the incidence of maltreatment of children uh, per 1,000 children rose from 9.8 to 23.1, doubling over that 13-year period. Picking up from the end of that sample to 2006, emotionally neglected children more than double. Uh, so what we're seeing is as societal things decay, family units, uh, more child born out of wedlock, all these kind of social trends that we see, they really affect children in their development. And that leads to maladaptive personality traits, such as narcissism. Um, that's kind of the most grim side of it. The one that you may have more experience with is just general society. And this is the social psychology view that the world we live in kind of molds our character. Um, you may have overindulgent helicopter parents. Uh, this is generally the baby boomers who uh, had deprived childhoods, and so they overcorrected, and they raised a generation of mostly the millennials. They had these overinvolved, uh, praising parents. They protect their kids, and uh, had some bad effects. Um, people wanted to be very individual, individualistic. Uh, they wanted to achieve and give their children a better life. Um, this is where we see things like everyone gets a trophy. You go to AYSO soccer game, here's a trophy for the last place team, right? You've seen that mocked in many commercials. Um, but there's a real psychological value that's communicated when they say, you didn't do well, you underperformed, but we're still gonna recognize your achievement, okay? And that helps uh, contribute to the sense of narcissism. I need to be praised, I need to have attention um, from other people, I'm entitled to get things, even though I may not deserve them. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes about narcissism. I think it sums up why it's such an issue. Um, this is from a psychiatrist who's obviously dealt with uh, the more extreme form of it. He says, the bubble of narcissism is always at risk of bursting. That's why young people are higher on drugs than ever, drunker than ever, smoking more, tattooed more, pierced more, and having more and more and more sex. Earlier and earlier, raising babies before they can do it well because it makes them feel special for a while. They're doing anything to distract themselves from the fact that they feel empty inside and unworthy. Um, that's a sobering commentary on the society. And for me, it's just a reminder of how important it is uh, with my own children Right? I don't want this, okay? So I, as a parent, can try to um, prevent this and uh, develop healthier, uh, healthier ways of viewing and interacting with the world. So there you know what narcissism is. That's kind of the base. Okay? And this is what I delved into and said, this is the world of narcissism. Where is this interesting in accounting? Accounting research is honestly not that interesting sometimes. Uh, you can imagine debits, credits, wow, so interesting, right? <laughs> Um, so I'm more interested in the personality. I said, can I make this work? Can I have a career studying something I find interesting, but do it in the accounting world, the business world that I also am interested in? Um, and the best place to look is CEOs, because um, they're most likely to be narcissistic. And there's a reason for that. Narcissists are achievement-oriented. They have charisma. Uh, they're able to paint bold pictures of the future and rally the troops to engage and, and commit to the firm uh, goals and vision. Uh, they're very inspiring. Um, and you, you stop and think, we want that in leaders. So is this a good trait for leaders to have? It very well could be. Uh, especially if you have a firm that might be young 
It needs to grow. It needs to uh, put out a message. Okay? A narcissistic CEO might actually be a, a beneficial thing. And that's why I don't want you to think this is necessarily bad. Okay? There are some really positive outcomes that could happen from this. The downside is they can also be very arrogant. Um, they can be self-serving. They're only looking out for themselves, maybe not their shareholders. Um, they are, want power, and they'll look for ways to achieve power. And interpersonally, they're going to lack empathy. And that's where a lot of people get frustrated with the narcissistic manager or CEO is because they lack empathy. They can't put themselves in their employee's shoes. Um, and that can you know, be really abrasive at times. There's a theory in management called upper echelons theory. And what this theory says is that we're trying to understand how firms behave. Why do firms do things? Well, firms are the summation of individual choices. Okay? They're human choices that we attribute to firms. And because of that, we, this theory says that some of those choices that we say firms make must be uh, some reflection of their managers, because the managers are the individuals making that choice. And so if we draw upon that theory, we say, well, let's look at narcissistic CEOs. And this is my favorite part of the research. Uh, how do you measure narcissism in a CEO? Um, do you think Scott Anderson at Zions Bank, who spoke last week, do you think he's going to sit down and fill out a survey for me <laughs> so that I know how narcissistic he is? Okay, really hard to do, okay, to get CEOs to devote their time, especially with a topic like this that may not look good on them. So we have to find a way to measure it. Uh, so there's these uh, two great researchers from Penn State who developed a measure that I've uh, drawn upon and uh, find to be useful. And it didn't really matter what the measures are, okay? We're kind of agnostic. But these are ones that actually turn out to be valid. Um, the first ones are the relative pay. Now remember, a, C, a narcissist feels superior, right? And they want to have a sense of superiority. So you can imagine that their pay gap. If uh, the CFO is being paid a million, they want to be paid two million, okay? And so we see a bigger pay gap, both in their cash and their options that narcissistic CEOs have a bigger pay gap than the other executives on their team. Then the, other, the third one is the picture size in their annual report. Uh, every year, a firm puts out a glossy uh, image of the firm with their financial statements, and they usually put a picture of the CEO on it. Um, so is this a good measure? Well, uh, in order to validate this, uh, there's been several researchers that worked on it. One of the things, they went to a group of employees and said, you'll fill out these scales. Fill it out as if you were the CEO. Rate your CEO's narcissism. And it turns out that that measure is very highly correlated with these other measures, the pay gap and the photo size. Another group went to analysts and said, you follow these CEOs all day. Rate their narcissism. And that one's like a 0.8 correlation, which is amazingly high that these analysts could, could peg uh, with, with the, the photo measure and the, the pay, that they would be so correlated. Then this last one, there's a, a new, newer paper that got a group of psychologists and said, here, watch these videos of these CEOs. You spend all day talking to people, rate their narcissism. And it turns out it's very highly correlated with these three measures. They're not perfect, uh, but I think they do give us some evidence that there are valid measures. Um, importantly, they're consistent over time. And so if you have the same person that goes to different firms, the measures stay stable. Okay? This is not a firm measure. If you have the same firm with two different CEOs, the measure is not stable. Okay? So it's not a firm attribute per se. Um, it really is affected by the CEO. So I know you're all going to be envious of me. I've sat and looked over 5,000 annual reports. Imagine this process. Okay. <laughs> Google, uh, GM, 2003 annual report. I gotta go find it in investor relations, I gotta download it, it's gotta be the right version, and then I gotta rate it, okay? Imagine doing that process over 5,000 times, okay? Super fun, okay? That's why you get a PhD, uh, so that you can do that, okay? So I wanna show you some of them, and show you what I, what I see, and I think you'll draw the same conclusion I have, that there's variation in the picture size. So here's a pretty bland one. Okay, CEO's letter to the shareholders, just signs it, okay? That's all you see, you see no picture of the CEO. Same thing here, uh, and I'm just showing the, the one page, okay, but you go through the whole report, there's no picture of the CEO in these ones. So this gets our lowest rating uh, of one. Um, here's the next one, uh, a two. 
who's the CEO? Okay, you don't know. Okay, now we're showing a bigger group, um, but we're not certain who the CEO is. Okay, so here's another example. You don't quite know who the CEO is here, but it's one of the two. Okay, so we're getting a little more, uh, I guess, visibility into the who the CEO is. Um, here's a three. This is kind of what I call the yearbook size. Okay, it's a little yearbook size picture that they put in. And it's just a CEO. He's by himself. Um, and I say he a lot because it's like 95% of my sample is male CEOs. And I'll talk to you about that a little bit more in a second. Um, here's another one, just a yearbook size up in the corner. Then we get into the fun ones. <laughs> okay, it's taking up half a page. There's some text, okay, but it's more prominent. Here's my favorite ones. <laughs> this is an eight and a half by 11 full page spread. And he has two of them for a few different years. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Nice big full page spread. And the next year, same thing. Um, I don't know why they couldn't get him to smile in here, but I think you'd want him to smile. Here he's smiling a little more, full page spread. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. Our goals are rather simple. We intend to double and perhaps triple our company's EBITDA over the next five years. If any of you know anything about company performance, that is just a crazy goal, right? I mean, to be able to achieve that type of growth is, uh, especially at a big firm, these are all big firms, is very impressive, okay? And here's another one, full page spread. <laughs> so you can see there's variation, okay, uh, in these, okay? And what we're saying is that CEOs that have pictures like this and have bigger pay gaps are gonna get a higher score on our narcissism index, okay? Um, so what do we know? What have we seen in the literature that these CEOs are doing? Um, first, I want to talk about firm strategy, which is really a, a likely place to look because the CEO is making decisions. This is really their ownership, right? The CEO, they kind of put forth strategy of the firm. Um, so one paper looked at CEOs in the computer hardware and software industry. And what they found is when the new CEO comes in and they're a narcissist, they change things. They go a new direction, okay? It's their vision, okay? Uh, and the way we see this happening is they do more advertising. They do greater selling expenses to kind of get their firm out. We're gonna push our revenue, we're gonna do better, we're gonna be bigger. They do more research and development, okay? And that's kind of really steering. We're gonna get new directions. We're gonna do new things. We're gonna be innovative. And they also take on more debt, okay? Because they're gonna do more, they gotta get money somehow. Um, we also see that they have more acquisitions and larger acquisitions, okay? They're, they grow, okay? They're empire builders. And you think about a narcissist, right? That puts their firm more visible. Uh, they're in the news more. We're merging, we're acquiring, we're doing these great things. Um, and what they find that this results in is they get really big wins and they get really big losses, okay? Uh, from these bold choices they're making. Um, another thing we see, and this is in a broader sample of firms, is the CEOs, they look at CEOs who have served on other boards of other companies, and what they do is they borrow the ideas. They imitate more than non-narcissistic CEOs. And why would, you, why would you do that, right? Why would you imitate more? Um, I mean, I can see that you'd want to be unique if you're a narcissist. But what's actually happening is they're getting a sense of legitimacy, and that's what scholars have found with the imitation of other companies is it gives you a sense of legitimacy. Look, we're doing what's the best what other companies are doing. Um, what's interesting is that the opposite thing uh, happens with, if you have board of directors who serve at the firm with a narcissistic CEO, and say that board of directors has experience in a certain industry, we think we'd draw upon their experience, we'd bring that to our firm, no, okay? Uh, the narcissistic CEO suppresses those ideas and they'll actually go in a different direction than their board of directors, okay? It's not their idea, okay? Uh, so they, they don't uh, play nice with others, is I think what I take from that. One way they influence that is when a CEO takes office, and he's a narcissist, the board of directors appointed after him are more likely to be narcissist as well, okay? So you can, you can see that happen. I become the CEO, I've got these grand visions, I don't want the governing mechanism of my firm to stand in my way. So I'm gonna appoint other people 
to my board who will support my vision. Um, and we see that happen, that when they get these other directors who are also narcissists, that relationship between risky spending, research and development actually gets stronger because they've surrounded themselves with other narcissists. Um, here's a great quote from a, a partner at a consulting firm um, that came up during the research. And she said, uh, as a director, I'm very aware of the narcissist behavior of CEOs. When I worked at a major consulting company, there were some clients, CEOs, who are clearly narcissistic. Partners at our company for sure talk about the client CEO's personality. When asked how she knew that they were narcissists, she said this, the way they interact with people gives you a feeling that they feel like the greatest men, okay? Superiority, authority, lack of empathy. Huge offices, big fancy cars, and a large number of assistants are all indicators of their narcissism. Now that doesn't mean if someone drives a fancy car they're a narcissist, but it means that narcissists often drive fancy cars, is the way I look at that. <laughs> Okay? They go with big mergers and acquisitions. We just talked about that. They initiate a lot of things. Okay? That's the research development. Um, but they don't care about the details. You can tell that they take criticism as personal attacks. Okay? So there's someone's personal experience that's very consistent with what we've seen through the research. Um, one of the things that happens when they go with these big wins, big losses, okay, they incur big losses. And research has shown that, interestingly enough, they, they don't process it. They don't, they don't uh, usually when people incur a loss, okay, they sense some sense of fear or conservativeness in response to the loss. Not so with the narcissist. They still take just as much risk, okay? If they fail, they fail, they fail, they'll still keep taking the risky behavior. They don't change. Um, so they'll still engage in the R&D, the big capital expenditures, even though they may not have been working. Um, the other part of this that I found was so interesting from this study was if the narcissist was getting social praise, okay, attention from the community, from the employees, um, from the media covering their firm, um, then they take on more, okay? This fuels, okay? So objective performance measures they ignore and they keep the same risky behavior, but if you give them praise, they do it more, okay? Um, and I feel like this finding is, you know, you, you'd think a firm would be well managed, they have the board of directors, they have all these managers, but the individual CEO actually has this effect. Uh, I th still find it amazing that we find that effect in the research, that it's so strong that one individual, okay, can get social praise and that affects how their firm spends money. Um, one of the other things they'll do, and this is kind of taps into the attention seeking I want to be uh, praised for the work I do is uh, there's this movement in business, corporate social responsibility. We're going to engage in green, environmentally concerned efforts. We're going to be involved with charities. Um, what a great way to get attention, right? To get press, to get people uh, doing media segments on your firm. And so narcissistic CEOs actually spend more money on corporate social responsibility, even though it it's actually not more successful at their firms. They do spend more money trying to get this uh, attention uh, in image reinforcement. All right, now this one's actually from my own research. Um, and the way this came about was as my first year summer paper uh, as a PhD student. I said, you know, where am I gonna look in accounting? Well, the most fundamental thing in accounting that people care about is earnings per share. Okay, this is what analysts forecast at, uh, for firms, this is what you often see on uh, news feeds, do they meet or beat earnings, okay? This is earnings per share. This is a fundamental number for accounting. And so the question was, well, narcissists have this mixed bag where sometimes they could be really good attributes for their firm and other times it might be bad attributes. So the question is, do they have better performance? Okay, so far we've just talked about strategies, not necessarily performance. And we find that they actually have higher earnings. And it follows from valuation models. If you have higher earnings, you should have higher stock prices. And guess what? They have higher stock prices. Who wouldn't want that, right? You want more earnings, you want higher stock prices. That's, you know, that's good for everyone. Um, part of the challenge is the way to achieve this. So uh, I won't get into the technical accounting on this, but earnings is the numerator, shares outstanding is the denominator. So what we did is we looked at how do they affect those two spots. So I'll start with the denominator. 
You can affect shares outstanding by buying shares. Your firm can go buy your own shares of, uh, that are out in the market, and you can reduce the denominator, which should make earnings go up. Okay? It's kind of a false way to make yourself look better. We don't find that narcissistic CEOs do this. Okay? They don't manipulate the shares. So then you look at the numerator and say, well, what affects earnings? Okay? It could be accounting. There's judgment in accounting. They could make uh, different accruals is what we call them. And we don't find any evidence that they affect accounting accruals. So there's this other way, and that's where you can make real business decisions that affect how your earnings are recorded, um, such as inventory production decisions. If you build your inventory, okay, the way accounting works is you put some of the cost on your balance sheet, and they just get stuck there until you sell the goods. And so if you're building inventories, you're putting cost on your balance sheet which means those costs don't end up on your income statement. And so this is a way that narcissistic CEOs can make their earnings look better because they don't have the cost on their income statement, but they get stuck with all these costs on their balance sheet. So they look better, okay? But this is a short-term fix. Well, surprisingly enough, narcissistic CEOs have shorter tenures than non-narcissistic CEOs, okay? I'm going to make my firm look good, and then I'm going to move on to the next great thing. So... Um, that's what we found in that paper. Um, now, I said they didn't affect the accounting, per se. But in the extreme, okay, there's other ways than just accruals to affect your accounting. And we find that they actually are more likely to commit fraud, an intentional criminal misrepresentation of what your financial statements are. Um, and so narcissistic CEOs, here's that deviant side coming forth. If they, if they can't do things with strategy, or real decisions, well, I'll just change the numbers, intentionally and criminally um, do that. Um, here's another one that you might find interesting. Uh, this is one of my own papers. Um, we asked the question of, well, there's this tax behavior. And one of the things that a narcissistic CEO needs, right? I told you they take on more debt. Well, they need cash. If you're going to buy other firms or engage in research and development, you need cash. Well, one of the best ways to get cash is to not give it to the government through taxes. Um, so we said, let's go find out if they pay less in taxes. And sure enough, they use corporate tax shelters, which is a fancy way of saying they avoid more taxes. They structure their, uh, the way their firm, their policies, where they're located. They do all these uh, tax planning techniques. Some of them you might be, uh, say, are perfectly legal, and some of them are questionable. And they do this to avoid taxes. Why? So they get cash. Okay? Uh, the bottom there, you see they get, on average, 33 to $78 million less paid in taxes. That's real dollars that they can then use to fuel whatever else they want to do. Um, the other part of this that uh, it's really a technical thing in accounting, but if you have uncertain tax positions, uh, which is to say, I'm going to put this on my tax return, I'm not sure if the IRS is going to uphold it. And in accounting, we just say, if it's more likely than not, you can do it. Okay? But you have to book a reserve, which is to say, we may not get this benefit, but we could. Okay? And so those are called UTBs, uncertain tax benefits. Okay? And narcissistic CEOs have more of these, which means they take riskier tax positions, which may not uphold. Okay? But if you think about the legal process involved there, it takes years, right? The IRS has got to audit it. You have that probability. Then they have to negotiate in court. What are we actually going to pay? What should we pay? So this is going to take time. So this is a really easy way for a narcissistic CEO to uh, free up cash by taking an uncertain tax position. And he may not be around when it actually comes back uh, or reverses. Now, I told you the most narcissistic CEOs are male. Um, or most CEOs are no. Most CEOs are male. Um, that's a talk for another day. Um, but there are female CEOs. And so um, I've got some new research with some faculty here at Utah State uh, where we're looking at what happens with the female CEO. And this is really interesting because uh, personality traits manifest differently across gender. So you have a high narcissist male, a high narcissist female, and they're going to be perceived differently, even though they may engage in the same behavior. Um, women leaders who display these narcissistic tendencies are perceived by men's subordinates as less effective leaders than equally narcissistic men leaders. Okay? Uh, and I'm not sure what 
is the full cause behind that. It's just to say that the, the male and female leader are perceived differently, even with the same behaviors. Um, organizations that are led by women CEOs have, have been found to be more equity-based. They're fair, they're more transparent. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the things that limits often female CEOs is they don't have support. Okay? They can't implement their decision. Often they're the lone female. Um, and this research shows that having a, a second female maybe on the board, it actually really benefits. Okay? If they're the lone female, they call this token status. They're the only female, and they have a hard time uh, implementing their decisions. So we took this and said, well, let's look at this with narcissism. And what we find is that women CEOs are just as likely to exhibit narcissism as male CEOs. Um, so there's not a differential there. But what is different is that the narcissistic women CEOs don't engage in this risk-taking, this spending on research and development on capital expenditures um, that the male CEOs do. And they don't engage in the questionable behaviors that the male CEOs do. So we see a complete opposite result um, with female CEOs. And likely it's because, you know, uh, they're just not able to carry their vision because they're female and they're perceived differently than the male CEO. Um, one of the final questions we asked um, is, given all this behavior that we see CEOs that are narcissistic engaging in, there's other parties to this, okay, that are observing and engaging with, with those firms. Are they picking up on this? Are they aware that uh, that firm is engaging these behaviors because of the narcissistic CEO? So the first area we looked was a very accounting one, uh, is the auditing world. These auditors have to go uh, and check the financial statements. Are they accurate or not? So what auditors use is they use this audit risk model. And the audit risk model is three components, inherent risk, control risk, and de detection risk. Inherent risk and control risk are just assessed by the auditor. They go in and they say, what's the business risk of this company? What's the likelihood we might see fraud in this company? Uh, do they have a risky business that they might feel more pressure? And we just assess the inherent risk. Then they assess the control risk, which is all the procedures or policies in place to make sure that financial accounting is done properly. So they make an assessment of that. And then they, they set this last part, the detection risk. So if inherent risk is high and control risk is high, then the detection risk is going to be set low, which is the risk that they're not going to find what they need to. Okay? So if they just set, I should say this, if they set detection risk low, they have to do more work. They've got to go look at more uh, accounts receivable. They've got to go look at more inventories. They've got to do things tighter because they're uncertain. Okay? So we argue that narcissistic CEOs have a higher inherent risk. Okay? Their business risk, the way they're engaging a business is riskier. There's more pressure at the firm where people might be more likely to engage in fraud. Um, they, they, we also test to see if they're a higher control risk. And we find that they have more control weaknesses where their controls don't work, so they, have to, they can't rely on them. You have to do more uh, work as the auditor. So we find the auditors charge higher fees to narcissistic CEOs from doing more work. Um, I didn't put the stat here. I think it's on average about $120,000 more in fees paid just because your CEO is a narcissist. Um, so that's, again, real money and costs going out. So the auditors pick up on this as part of their process. Um, one of the other things uh, that we're currently working on is what do analysts do? Okay, Because analysts see these projections from CEOs. Um, and this is a developing paper, but what we find is analysts uh, kind of take it with a grain of salt. If the CEO puts out a projection, they will uh, kind of par back their own projections because they, they know that narcissists are usually full of themselves uh, is what we're finding. So I think uh, the question we may need to ask in this forum is, are they effective? And I don't, I don't know if the answer is clear. Uh, on all the research I've done or read about, I see that there are some really positive performance outcomes where firm strategy might be developed, and might be a really good thing to have this vision and charisma put forth by a narcissistic CEO. But it could also be detrimental, because they'll do things that are in their own interest and not the firm's interest. The performance outcomes are a little bit sticky, because 
what I see is that their performance is actually better. And it's hard to argue, and this may be why they, we keep seeing narcissistic CEOs put in place, because if their performance is better, we can put up with the bad interpersonal, right? You can deal with the angry boss if the performance is better. Um, <laughs> so that one's a little bit unclear. Um, in the extreme form, right, we might see that they uh, do questionable things on their taxes. They, they may engage in fraud, and obviously those are things we would not want in a firm. Um, the overall conclusion I've taken from this is that tone of the top matters. Who your, who your firm leader is has a significant effect on how your firm implements choices, what choices it makes, the vision it takes, um, and how it's run. Uh, uh, it really has a, a significant effect. And then finally, there's just real benefits and costs. And as students, as you go through your career, you're going to have bosses that may fit what I've described, and you're going to have to weigh the benefits and costs of, and, and maybe learn how to deal with some of the costs that are imposed from a narcissistic CEO. Um, so uh, if with that, I'll uh, open up to any questions that we may have uh, in the remaining time. You know, that's a great, and I'd love to have a research assistant to help gather that data. <laughs> um, what I do know about social media is, is not necessarily at the firm level. Um, there are studies that are being done uh, about how they post, right? They'll mention themselves more. They'll put more s selfies up. Um, they'll have more foul language in their posts. Um, and that might be something, the way I tie that to the business world is employers look at your Facebook pages when they hire you. And so you may want to be aware that those things could affect your future career track. Um, it would be interesting to see like Twitter accounts. I know there's some research on that. Uh, there's obviously good examples of political leaders and firm leaders that use Twitter. Uh, it might be interesting to study that. All right, any other questions? Uh, just looking at the growth in narcissism over time, I wonder, is there any indication that that growth could be from more social accept acceptability of narcissism? Are we more accepting of that trait nowadays, or is it true growth in narcissism controlling for the acceptability of that trait? Great question. So I think the best uh, study on that is the Mirror Effect book. What they did is they looked at a celebrity narcissist, and they showed that celebrities have higher narcissism than the average population, higher narcissism than the average MBA student. Um, and what they argue there is, you know, we kind of accept celebrity behavior. People will have very extreme uh, Charlie Sheen, Paris Hilton, very dysfunctional behavior that gets mirrored by youth uh, because they see it and they think it's acceptable. Um, so I think the proliferation of tolerance of celebrity behavior certainly contributes to, we can accept that narcissism is you know, we think that's normal. What's well, not normal? But the way the media portrays it, it is normal. How about in your research of in, uh, personnel or even teams, or the key that you turn over in narcissistic firms over less narcissistic firms? Any indicators there? The, the one indicator I know from the data is just the CEO level, that the CEO will turn over more often. Um, my, I haven't looked at their cause. This is actually a really good study. Um, I think more often it's the narcissistic CEO is moving on to the next great thing, right? They're trying to move up in the world, the next big firm. But it could be because they're dysfunctional as well. Um, and I'm not certain why. Any other questions? Yeah. So is narcissism a character trait you consider to be curable? So there, there is some studies in psychology, uh, and the, the short answer is yes and no. Um, you know, through time, people can uh, adapt their behaviors, uh, whether that's through personal discipline, uh, being aware, and they, you know, they're aware of this behavior, and they curtail it themselves, or through counseling. Um, but some of these personality traits are really sticky over time. Um, 
though the research would suggest that you know what might be early in your life you may be a high level narcissist and you, your traits are very abrasive and aggressive you may be able to tone that back the manifestation of your personality but you may still have the same high personality um, we usually see maybe it's just growing up that uh, people kind of temper over time uh, though it's not always the case Um, there has not been a great study on that, and the reason why it's really hard to control for all the factors, right? This, it's kind of an, it's, we use the term endogenous. It's this choice the firm makes of who they're going to hire and what circumstances. The results that I've shown in most of these studies, we try to control for firm characteristics at the time the CEO is hired so that we can say this is really the, C, the CEO, not the choice of the CEO. Um, that's just a sticky issue in research. It's more a... a technical econometric issue than it is anything. Um, it would certainly be great if there was evidence on that. There's another one right here. I'm just wondering if you see any like patterns with certain industries, or with, yeah, with certain industries, you know, like mm -hmm. finance industry is more likely to have a narcissistic CEO versus a different. Yeah, and this, this is a question I've gotten uh, several times. Um, I can't conclusively answer it because our data is limited, so we just look at the Fortune 500, which sounds like a lot of firms, but it's not the you know, S&P 1500, it's not, it's not big. So we have a lot of limitations in the data. Um, there really isn't, at least in my data. Uh, I did do that analysis on the S&P 1500 one. There, there just wasn't. You know, you, you'll see someone in the energy industry or the, uh, the entertainment industry. Um, I think it's just more about being a CEO than in anything. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming today. We'd like to thank Dr. Olson for his presentation. And the question I had for him was I wanted to ask him if he's a narcissist. But we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that alone for now. Thank you for all that you've done. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.